السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته So that helped, ما شاء الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى وصلى الله وسلم على عباده الذين اصطفى we praise Allah upon all conditions. He is the creator. He created entire creation. He created you and I. He created those before us. He created those we like. He created those we don't like. He created the Muslims. He created the non-Muslims. He created humankind. He created animals. He created all the other creatures. Why? He is the creator. He created it because he wanted to create entire creation. And he says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I haven't created mankind and jinn kind except for them to worship me. Which means I'm going to test them. I want them to do something. If they do it the way I tell them to do it, they will be successful. If they don't do it the way I want it, they have failed. All praise is due to Allah. All praise is due to the maker, the nourisher, the cherisher, the sustainer, the provider, the protector, the curer, the one in whose hands lies your happiness and mine. The one in whose hands the, lies the solution to your problems and mine. The one in whose hands lies your paradise and mine, your forgiveness and mine. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be praised. Amen. Praise be to Allah upon all conditions. We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We prove that we are not jealous of those whom Allah has raised above us. Rather, we thank Allah for those gifts. Because it is Allah who chooses who to elevate and who to drop. When he chose the best of creation as Muhammad, peace be upon him, we consider it an honor. We follow him. When he chooses some above others, we consider it his power. We ask Allah to bless every one of us. With the blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we don't forget to send blessings and salutations upon those who came before from the time of Adam because they were all humankind. And the messengers who came with their own companions, some had few, some had more. May Allah bless even the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and every one of us and our offspring. Those to come up to the end. Say Ameen. May Allah bless them. You might be thinking, I don't have offspring. Well, if you make a dua for blessed offspring, Allah will grant you a blessed spouse. So when we say, may Allah give you a blessed offspring, may Allah bless our offspring. Say Ameen. In order for spouses. Ameen. My brothers and sisters, I want to tell you, while we are talking about raising this ummah and the children of this beautiful ummah, we must start by thinking of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the creator, the one whom we are going to go back to, definitely. You're going to go back to Allah. I'm going to go back to Allah. He made me. I did not choose my parents. I did not choose the location of my birth. I did not choose my race. I did not choose the amount of wealth that I would be born into or the conditions. Moments ago, we saw these children. It is our duty to reach out to them, even if it means by a dua or by a few nairas or dollars or pounds, because Allah could have placed me in exactly that place. But I thank Allah, showing gratitude to Allah that He has made me much better than so many. I will reach out to those whom Allah has perhaps not chosen what He chose for me. But trust me, He's chosen certain things better for them than I. Allah gives everyone gifts, but they need to recognize those gifts. When we talk of raising the ummah and raising our children, we need to understand, like I said, the first thing is, who is Allah? He's your maker, he made me. And like I said, I didn't choose my color, so I must respect all colors. I didn't choose my nationality. Life has become such that we have arrived at a point where your nationality is connected to certain factors. 
But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose for you where you will be born hence or the circumstances surrounding your life. So you have a certain nationality. If it is connected to your birth, you had nothing to do with it. And if it is connected to your movements, perhaps you may have had a small role that Allah allowed you. But I want to tell you, my brothers, my sisters, if you understand who is Allah, you will understand that you and I are here temporarily. Life will definitely be a struggle. Life is going to be such a struggle because Allah wants us to appreciate paradise. If life was not a struggle and we had everything that we wanted or needed in life, then paradise would lose its value. You need to realize that Allah has created difficulties in order for us to prove our connection with Him. So there will be hardship. There will be loss of life. There will be calamity. And Allah tells us, I'm going to test every one of you. With what? With a little bit of fear and some hunger. And loss. Material loss. Allah says, I'm going to test you. I'm going to test you. Loss of life, loss of produce. So much of loss in various aspects of your life. Allah says, he's going to test every one of us. May Allah make it easy for us. So those of us who think that life is going to be a little paradise are mistaken. The wealthiest of us also has issues and problems and difficulties and hardship when Allah gives you get close to Allah when Allah takes away from you get close to Allah you are just a human when you falter turn back to Allah so when you know that Allah is the creator he made me without me being chosen to be made you will understand that Allah Almighty will choose offspring for us Primarily, he chooses for us, our spouses, although he has given us a role to play in that. You want to marry someone, subhanallah, be like a person whom that person will want to marry as well. You have a person who wants to marry a good guy, a pious guy, or a man who wants to marry a good woman, a lovely, pious woman who is connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but... They're not interested in leading their lives in a way that that person would want someone like them. That's a point of starting. When I want to marry, I need to be the person that someone of that nature would want to marry in the first place. So let's mend our connection with Allah. Nothing will happen without a connection with Allah. And Allah knows we are human because He made us. You connect yourself with Allah, you've done a favor. To everyone who's going to interact with you right up to the end. When you disconnect from Allah, you've actually paid a disservice to yourself to begin with. You disconnected. You unplugged. This is why salah is five times a day. Connection with Allah is every day. The reason is you need that connection in order to be able to protect yourself. Connect yourself to your maker and connect those who are going to be connected to you with the maker as well. You might be thinking, we're talking of raising the ummah. Where are you going? Where did you start? Well, I want to start in a different way. My brothers and sisters, I'm very, very proud of Lagos today. May Allah bless you. In your thousands, sitting for hours, Listening to Qalallahu wa qala Rasulu is not a joke. May Allah bless you. I don't know what it must have costed to put up this facility for today and whatever is here, but I feel like giving double the amount of whatever the ticket was to one ummah so that the next time they have it, they can actually have it free for us. So if you would really like to appreciate what you have been blessed with today, you need to dig into your pocket over and above thanking Allah. 
Because this, I can tell you, is not free. One ummah, I am proud of this achievement. May Allah bless you and grant you strength. Wallahi, it's amazing. From where I am standing, if you could see what I can see, subhanallah, subhanallah, you would know that people fear Allah. They love Allah. They want to be closer to Allah, even though they are living in the challenges of the world that are so tempting that we actually falter sometimes. But we want Allah. We love Allah. And we want Allah to love us, don't we? May Allah love all of us. So my brothers and sisters, the biggest favor you can do your unborn children is to choose for them a mother or a father who's going to be the best. Did you hear that? The biggest favor you can do for your unborn children is to choose a mother or a father for them who will be the best. So remember, moments ago we heard Sheikh Abdul Hamid and the others speak about how we will be recruiting for a job, subhanallah. The job as a spouse, but I'm also a spouse, subhanallah. So that favor that you're doing your children would start off by you improving yourself as you're young and as you are growing older. Sister Maryam told us moments ago that 70% of those attending today, according to some who just did a quick survey, are unmarried. Subhanallah. May Allah best bless you with the best of offspring. You know that dua, right? You know the dua. What that means is it's an inclusive dua. It includes in it your spouse and whatever else and the happiness that comes with it and then the offspring that would be given the best of upbringings by the best of parents i mean but i must be the best parent myself allah is not going to change the condition of a nation until and unless every individual changes himself or herself i must start with myself people say the problems we are facing as an ummah. That one's to blame, that one's to blame, that one's to blame. Yes, people might look and lay blame, but the solution of it lies with you and I. If every one of us can change ourselves, trust me, we've changed the whole ummah. May Allah grant us that change. So my brothers and sisters, as we grow older, and like I said, I'm addressing people who are mostly not married. Improve yourself. Develop your taqwa. Develop your consciousness of Allah. Why? He made you. That's why. He created you. That's why. <laughs> Indeed, for him was the creation. He made, he created in the first place. So, he has the right to instruct. To issue an instruction. Why do you think Allah has the right to tell you and I what's halal and haram? Why do you think Allah has the right to tell you and I to fulfill our salah five times a day? Because He made you, that's why. He made you, so He has the right. Had He not made us, He wouldn't have any right to tell us, worship me alone, subhanallah. So when you worship Allah alone, you've developed yourself. You begin to see the light. Do you know what Allah says? Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu in tattaqullaha yaj'al lakum furqana O you who believe, if you are going to develop your relationship with Allah, He is going to give you the ability to distinguish. Criterion. The ability to tell between right and wrong, between that which is correct, incorrect, the darkness and the light, all of that, you are given a gift from Allah to be able to tell what to do and what not to do. My brothers and sisters, many of us are drowning in materialism where our makeup means more than our own salah. Subhanallah. And it's not fair for me to just give an example of makeup because the brothers are also deep into their designer names. And so many other materialistic things, the cars, the wealth, the earning, etc. All of that, there is a limit to its permissibility. And that is, if it comes in the way between you and Allah, then that's where you stop. Because Allah gets preference always. 
So don't let yourself drown in materialism. It's not about your accessories. It's not about the latest phone. Although we appreciate those things because we are just human. MashaAllah. We are human. I can speak for myself. If I see, for example, I have a phone called the Samsung 9 Plus. I have it. I'm sure when the 12 Plus comes out, I'll give the 10 a break, perhaps the 11 a break. When the 12 comes out, I'm going to be keen to look at it and think, ah, I need to update my phone. It's human nature. But I'm not going to steal anyone's money in order to do that. Nor am I going to do something clandestine in order to be able to achieve something I want. No, I must still remember I belong to Allah. My duty unto Allah is such that I will ever I will fulfill whatever I should for the sake of Allah. Relying upon Allah to ensure, meaning Allah will ensure. Once you rely on Allah, Allah will ensure that you are taken care of. You know, I, I like to give this example. وَمَا مِن فِي الْأَرْضِ إِلَّا عَلَى اللَّهِ رِزْقُهَا Everything that walks on earth, Allah promises that it is up to us to cater and provide for those things that move. Everything that moves, we will provide for it. We guarantee. When Allah can take care of an ant that I cannot see, do you really think Allah is not going to take care of me, you and I? Moments ago, I was speaking to a group of sisters. I asked them, who from amongst you is married? All of them said we are not married. Subhanallah. May Allah make it easy. But I promise you, I'm going to say a statement that some of you might disagree with, but I have to get it off my chest. If Allah has kept you single for a reason, while you keep trying and trying, He knows that there is something in this that is best for you. I always tell those who are struggling to get married and they are trying and they cry. Number one, may Allah make it easy for you. May Allah grant you spouses who will be the coolness of your eyes. But number two, I swear being a counselor myself, being married to an idiot, one who's going to trouble you, harass you, create issues for you that would probably result in suicidal thoughts is not as good as being single. Subhanallah. I'd rather be single than married to an idiot. And I heard some sisters say, I'd rather have a quarter of a good guy than the whole of an idiot. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. I'm not here to promote or demote anything that Allah has permitted. Because that is there. If it's permissible, it's permissible. If something is allowed, it's allowed. But I am here to tell you, if Allah has kept you in a certain condition, you need to understand there has to be wisdom behind it. Even though I may not know it right now. Allah knows it. One day he will tell me. But I trust Allah enough to know that he's kept me single. However, once again I make this dua. May Allah bless us all with spouses who will be the coolness of our eyes. And over and above that with children who will be the coolness of our eyes. Because it brings me to the next point. We're talking of children but we have to spend a moment to pray for those who are married but they have a new problem what's it they don't have kids that is your jannah your sabr is your jannah your patience is your jannah there are so many from amongst us whom allah has blessed with a beautiful loving spouse but unfortunately no children do you accept that as what allah has chosen for you Accepting what Allah has chosen for you does not mean that you shouldn't try whatever you have to or can medically and other halal ways to get the children, to conceive, for example. It's permissible. You should try. There's no harm. Beyond a certain point, you might find it's a small medical matter. It may be. So your trial is also an ibadah. It's an act of worship. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ has told us that it is part of the plan of Allah to want us to reproduce. So we have to spend a moment dedicating 
or dedicated to those who don't have offspring. May Allah bless you with offspring. May Allah grant you sabr. I've become very sensitive to ask married couples, do you have kids? Sometimes that question, if they've been trying for 10, 15, 20 years, it becomes a point of sadness within the heart. So I've become a little bit sensitive. I try to ask the least questions. Unless I'm very close to you, then I would know. Some of us have been blessed with offspring, both boys and girls. So someone says, how many children do you have? And you might just say, so many boys, so many girls. Can I tell you how many I have? You want to know? MashaAllah, seven girls. MashaAllah, and two boys. We thank Allah for that. We thank Allah for that. I know one of my colleagues... He had a daughter and then another daughter and a third daughter and a fourth daughter and a fifth daughter and a sixth daughter and a seventh daughter and an eighth daughter and a ninth daughter and a tenth daughter and an eleventh daughter and a twelfth daughter and a thirteenth daughter and they were just daughters. MashaAllah. His name is Sheikh Asim Al-Hakim. Grant him goodness. You might have heard that name, right? But Allah blessed him. He's blessed. And so are we. When you have males alone, you are blessed. When you have females alone, you are blessed. When you have male and female, you are blessed. And when you have neither male nor female, you are blessed in ways that perhaps you have not yet understood. Allah might have chosen you for something far greater. Go out and search. What's the purpose? What is it? Don't be angry and upset with Allah. So the reason why I'm actually spending a lot of time on this is because... And I told the organizers, by the way, that since there's no Q&A, and since it's the last talk, and since the people have come from the morning right up to now, please let me talk. Don't give me a time limit. <laughs> so I promise you, my brothers and sisters, people complain when they have boys only. People complain when they have girls only. People complain when they don't have kids. And when they, when they have both boys and girls, guess what they're doing? They're complaining, ah, these kids of mine. So who is thanking Allah? Who is thanking Allah? Alhamdulillahi ala kulli hal. Remember when I started, I spent a moment to explain the praise of Allah and that everything is from Allah and we praise Him upon all conditions. This is what it is. On the day of judgment, a caller will call. Where are those who used to praise Allah? Whether it was happiness or sadness, they still praised Allah. They will be given a VIP treatment. Because they praised Allah. In sickness, they praised Allah. We all have to get sick. Have you thought about something? A flu. You know the normal flu that we have. It is sometimes seasonal. It comes back every year. Why? Some of us are healthier. Maybe every two years, maybe a little bit more or less. A guy like me with a weak immune system, I thank Allah. It happens much more often. But alhamdulillah, we thank Allah. Why does Allah make us go through that every... To, to realize how powerful He is and how weak we are. No matter who you are, small droplet infection can actually make you bedridden for two weeks. And you are a powerful person, subhanallah. To show you, man, you are actually very, very insignificant compared to Allah. Just thank Allah. Thank Allah. Let that be an opportunity of gaining closeness to Allah. Now let's get to those whom Allah blesses with children. Number one, I firmly believe that as you get married and you've chosen a good spouse, and mashallah, you've made the right decisions and you've looked at the guidance from Allah and now you're married. It doesn't mean you need to have children ASAP. As soon as possible, we're going to have offspring. If you've chosen that in an enlightened fashion, alhamdulillah. And if it has happened from Allah, alhamdulillah. But if you could, I'd rather you actually gave it a little bit of a break to get to know one another a little bit better this advice would not have been given to you a few decades back, but now it is because we are facing thousands, if not millions of children of divorced couples, broken homes who are struggling, who've lost the path completely. And it was quite simple to wait. When I look at them, they were normally and usually born within the first year of marriage, sometimes the next. 
Why didn't you just wait a while? I need to make sure that I really believe this person is deserving to be the father of my kids or the mother of my kids. It's not haram from an Islamic perspective. No, not at all. Especially when you see the result of the mistakes people are making. They have one kid, two, three, four, and after that, everything is gone. What happened? You kept her pregnant. Why? For whatever reason. It's not prohibited. But why did you bring in kids when you knew there was something wrong with your relationship or you were not yet 100% certain of it? It's not wrong. You cannot speak about raising an ummah without advising couples to say, be careful, hold on, relax. Don't just be so quick. I remember recently I attended a wedding. At that wedding, I met the, the groom I gave him a hug and I told him, may Allah bless you with offspring. He told me, not just yet. I told him, why? We're learning, right? He said, I want to travel the world. I want to enjoy life, just me and her. And perhaps after five, ten years, we'll have kids. I told him, and how do you know that you're going to have a life that will span beyond or up to that five or ten years? How do you know? What, why did I ask him the question, how do you know? Because, because I wanted him to correct that slightly to say that inshallah, I'd like to wait until I'm 100% certain rather than making it a dunya and a worldly reason to say, I want to see the world. You can see the world with your kids. That's just an excuse. Because daddy don't want to help mommy anymore. So he says, well, once we have kids, I'm sorry, you, we can't travel. Because you know, now it's a stress. Dad, the day you can take the baby, your own baby in your hands and tell your wife, please have a lovely, lovely sleep. I will take the baby and go into the next room to ensure that you have a great sleep because tomorrow is a Sunday and I don't have to go to work and I'll make you the breakfast and bring it for you. That's the day you have the happiest home. You have taught generations and people around you realizing that I am also a father as much as she is a mother. It doesn't mean that she has to do X, Y and Z. I know of people, subhanallah, as much as we as Muslims are taught not to mix our roles. Definitely, that's there. We don't mix our roles, but show me an Islamic evidence that tells you that as a man, there's no role for you to play in the upbringing of the child. It's only to do with the mother. Where is that? Show me the hadith. Show me the verse of the Quran. It's not there because parents it's your responsibility in a joint fashion. And one of the reasons that we are struggling, not only the divorce and the broken homes of people who want to have kids so quickly without realizing that it's my responsibility to this innocent child to make sure that if I wasn't 100% certain in my own way with my spouse, I shouldn't have brought that child. Number one. Number two is if you have the children learn to soften up towards your spouse because you know what it's not about you don't be selfish we have people who say i want to divorce her or i need a divorce my husband is a bad man how many kids do you have seven i'm fed up seven kids seven kids and now you realize he's a bad man subhanallah why don't you think for a moment and it, I'm not talking only about the women, but it happens with the men as well. She's born seven kids for you. And you say, I want to divorce her. Why? Ah, she's a 1960 model, you know. Now there's the millennials, you know. It's totally different, you know. That ride in the Lexus is far smoother, you know. A'udhu billah. What are you talking about? Do you have a brain? Do you realize it's not about you, your pleasure, your enjoyment, and only yourself? Now it's about children who are there, who you brought onto earth with the decree of Allah. And it's your duty to make sure you have sacrificed a little bit more to ensure they have a reasonable, decent life. Have you ever watched people run the race? The 100 meter relay, 
the 400 meter relay they call it 100 meters each and you pass the baton and you pass the baton i promise you my brothers my sisters in life we are called khalifa the term khalifa means those who come one after the other i I'm supposed to have gotten a baton from my parents and I'm supposed to hand it over to my children and they're supposed to give it to their children. That baton has the torch of the deen, subhanallah. I'm supposed to hand it and this is when I fulfill part of my duty unto Allah regarding why I'm on earth, subhanallah. So if I just say I don't want this marriage anymore, what did I do to the baton? You're running the relay halfway, you look at what was his name? Hussein Bolt. You look at him and you say, ah, it's okay. I'll leave the baton. I'm going away. Why are we going to lose anyway? He might run in a way that it will win. You may have children through whom Allah will grant you Jannah because of their dua, because of their goodness, because of the fact that you sacrificed. You wanted to see them succeed even though you didn't achieve what they have. And you couldn't have achieved it for whatever reason, maybe. But because you looked at the broader picture and you were not selfish, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will definitely let you taste the fruits of your sacrifice. If not in the dunya, then in the akhirah. And if you are fortunate, then in both. So if you are going to have children, remember, you need to sacrifice as parents. I was speaking about the point that the fathers also need to contribute in the marriage. The last time I was in Nigeria, in fact, not just the last time, but some time back, I asked a few brothers, have you ever changed a nappy of your kid? Talking of Mary. Nappy? What nappy? Nappy. I'm not saying it's your job. But I challenge you, have you ever done it? If you haven't, your fatherhood skills are not complete. We're only talking of skills. I'm not saying it's your job. My sisters, I'm not encouraging you to say, did you hear the talk today? There's, there's the nappy. This is something called wet wipes. This is something else. Go for it. And when he's done, you inspect it and say, ah, four out of ten try again tomorrow morning and then midnight you get him up forget about tomorrow morning it's happened do it again I'm not encouraging you to do that no let's not abuse religion let's not abuse things but what I am saying let's be conscious of one another let's love one another let's show that mawadda and rahma you know what that means when you're married Allah says Allah has placed between you Mawadda and Rahma. The love and the mercy. Mawadda is one of the highest levels of love. Allah didn't say Hub. Allah says Mawadda. Mawadda is a closeness and intimacy. That love that is filled with the highest level of affection, the care. And Rahma means mercy. That's the wife. That's my. The mother of my children, subhanallah, there is a rahmah. I feel the mercy. Part of the rahmah, isn't it that when you see her struggling, you can say, don't worry, tonight I'm on guard. That's what I'm saying. It's rahmah. So some people say, how come I'm married? Allah promises us mawadda and rahmah. I feel neither mawadda nor rahmah. Can I tell you one of the diagnoses? Because perhaps we're involved in sin. That's why. One of the reasons. Perhaps we have unplugged from Allah. Sins generally are of two types. One is, you're not doing what is compulsory. And two is, you're doing what is prohibited. Two things. So my brothers, my sisters, we don't feel the love because we're involved with another woman. That's why. So now you come home, you don't see the mother of your children as the mother of your children anymore. You see her as... This lady is five kilos more than the other one. Wow, five kilos. She gave birth to one child. You are fortunate, subhanallah. I remember a man with a belly, big belly. You know the men after the age of a certain age, maybe 35, 40, sometimes more, sometimes less, they develop a belly, subhanallah. That's the mercy of Allah. So that the woman can say,
So the wife tells his the wife tells her husband, you know what? You need to lose a bit of weight. Look at your belly. So he says, look at yours. She says, I'm pregnant. I'm about to give birth. I'm about to be a mother. He says, well, I'm about to be a father. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. We sometimes don't realize that as much as, I'm talking about men, as much as we'd love our wives to be the most good looking, you need to understand those looks go beyond that which is just physical and outward into the heart. Earlier I heard Sheikh Abdul Fattah say that after 10 years of marriage, then you actually now feel you're married. Did you hear him say that? Why? He worded it differently from what I would word it, but in essence, there comes a stage in your marriage when you begin to appreciate the sacrifice of your spouse if you are fearful of Allah. If you have taqwa and iman in you, if you have a heart, you begin to appreciate what your spouse has sacrificed for you and for this marriage and you get onto a new level of love. At that point, what you look like doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. It's your sacrifice. I love you. What have you done? You gave up your home. You gave up everything. You gave up your family. You gave up your area. You gave up sometimes your country. You traveled to a different continent. Can't I appreciate you as a spouse? Subhanallah. May Allah bless us. May Allah grant us goodness. My brothers and sisters, these children of ours are an amana from Allah. Just like your life is in the hands of Allah. Just like you wouldn't want your parent to think that they have the right to instruct you to do that which is against the command of Allah. You as a parent should understand the same about your child. The child is an amana. Do you know what the term amana means? Amana means it does not belong to you. Allah allows you to say, my son, my daughter, just for a short space of time. Could you have said that before the child was born? You couldn't because you didn't have the child. Where was the child? With Allah somehow, somewhere. Alam al-arwah, where the arwah were. But you couldn't say, my son, my daughter. Why? They weren't yours at that stage. They were still with Allah. The minute they were born or perhaps conceived, you say, my child. Once they are out in life, you say, my son, my daughter. Whose is that? Not yours. You are allowed to use the word my. At this juncture, yet it does not refer to ownership. Have you thought of that? I remember speaking to a group of people. And... One of the speakers with us raised an issue. After that, a question was asked. And the sister who asked the question got up and said, you know, my husband. My husband. So the, the guy gets up, the speaker says, hang on, hang on, hang on. You have 25% shares in this man. The other 75, you are granted as a gift to enjoy whilst it's not yet there. And I was like, gosh, did you have to say that right now? But I learned a lesson. He was trying to say, when you say my, it's not ownership. It's just a gift of Allah. For a while you can say it. But at some stage, Allah may take that away from you. Allah may take your husband away from you. Allah may take your child away from you. Who gave Allah the right to take my son away at the age of five? How can I even ask that question? It was Allah who gave me in the first place. And I want to tell you, those of you who have lost children, may Allah give you Jannah. Those children will be waiting for you, bi'ithnillah, to fight your case on the day of judgment. May Allah make it easy for us to earn Jannah al firdaus I promise you, my beloved brothers and sisters, 
If you think you have a problem, just go back to the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and read his life and you will find that he didn't lose one child. He didn't lose two children. He lost all his children in his lifetime besides one. Who was that one? Fatima radiallahu anha. She passed away just a few months after him. Have you lost children? If the answer is yes, the best of creation has lost all his children in his lifetime. It's not a sign of the displeasure of Allah. It's not a sign that Allah didn't choose you for something good. No. It could be a sign of the love of Allah. I remember a brother who had several children and he lost a few of them, a few of them in a car crash. And he was so upset. And 10 years later, he told me the amount of trouble that the rest of my kids have given me I sometimes through my weakness wish that Allah had taken them all away. If I had told him that years before, he would have probably thought I was some Satan. Satan. But he's saying it himself that I see the wisdom of Allah. Maybe Allah took these kids away because Allah did not want me to struggle with their with their upbringing, perhaps. So you don't know, you don't know what Allah has in store, what Allah has planned. You fulfill whatever you have to. But thank Allah, the child belongs to Allah. That's the meaning of amana. Allah will take the child away at any stage. Now I want to give you another example. May Allah take us all for hajj, say ameen. And Umrah, say Amin. Again and again, say Amin. MashaAllah. I'm sure one of those Amins is accepted. Okay. If your neighbor was going for Hajj and they were leaving the house and they told you, listen, here are the keys. Please, can you take care of the house? We're going for three weeks. We're going to come back. Do you have the right, once they're gone, to open the house, take the car, start driving, going out, change the paint of the car, come back, change the painting of the house, break a wall, make something else in the kitchen, take something away, put it back. When they come back, they'll say, what happened to this house? Right? We would never do that if we were honest people. We are doing it with our children. Allah gives us and says, look, I'm going to give you, you made dua for a good spouse we gave you. You made dua for children. I'm giving you for a while. I'm going to take this child away. And between now and then, I want you to make sure that you only do what I have told you to do because it's mine, not yours. So from a young age, do not let that child sit with cartoons, with phones. Wallahi, I've had a question that was asked to me not long ago saying, you know what, how can I seek the forgiveness of Allah because my three-year-old was watching pornography on my phone. Why? How? I couldn't believe it. But now your three-year-old knows more about your phone than mine. Or than anyone else's than anything else. Let me word it again. Your three-year-old knows more about your phone than you. They will pick it up. I recall I put a little finger. You know, there is, there is this uh, system of opening your phone with your eye and your finger. At one stage, it was the thumb. Now it's the eye. And the child says, no, come here. Don't just give me the phone. Bring your finger, put it here. It's your finger that's going to work here. The children know the pattern on your phone, how to open, what, what not. What? Number one is for a child to access porn at that age, it means it was somewhere in the phone. It was something was happening. You don't just click on a website. You don't know. But you have pressed either the history or a clip that's happening. Number one, promise Allah that you are going to delete all the clips from your phone that are immoral. Do we promise? What happened? Why are we reluctant? Do we promise Allah that we will delete all the clips from our phones that are immoral? It's still not good enough. So many of you are just silent looking at me like, there's nothing immoral on my phone. Come on, get away. Don't lie. Don't lie. Do you promise Allah 
We want children who are going to grow up with high values and we are not prepared to promise Allah that we will have high values. Come on. Do you promise Allah you will delete every clip that is in your phone that is immoral? A little bit better. MashaAllah. May Allah make it easy for us. Be strong. Be hard on yourself so that you don't need to be hard on your children. Many of us are so hard on our children. Wallahi, I receive emails telling me that, you know what, I caught my father doing this, doing that, watching porn with a girlfriend, with this, that. I've read some of it. What do I do? I'm broken. I don't know whether to bash his face or what to do. Allahu Akbar. Your father. Allah has blessed you, my beloved parents, with an automatic respect from those children. It's we who spoil it. Automatic. Like what I said, when you get married, if your heart is pure and your connection with Allah is good, wallahi, you have to feel the mawadda and rahmah. Because Allah promised that in the Quran. But if you don't feel the mawadda and the rahmah, the, the, the love and the mercy, there's something wrong with your connection with Allah. The same applies. Your children, Allah made them mimic you automatically. You wear hijab, two-year-old, one-year-old wants to wear the hijab. You read salah, my beloved brother, one-year-old, your son will fight to come to sujood next to you while you are reading salah. It's automatic. Who told the child? Nobody. That's why if you look at the hadith of salah, the Prophet ﷺ says, Muru awladakum bis salah, wa hum abna sab'i sinin. Instruct your children to read Salah when they are seven years old. Wow. When I looked at the Hadith, one of my teachers told us that that means don't instruct them before that. And I was like, what? How can I not instruct my child when he's four or five? I said, come, let's read Salah. You know what? I was taught that the child should do it just by you leading by example. Before the age of seven. Before the age of seven, the child shouldn't be instructed, but rather should want to do it without instruction. Because they've watched you. Sisters, mashallah, we are dressed so beautifully in lovely hijab. I always give an example to others in the Western world and even in Muslim countries. I tell them, when I go to Nigeria, come, come with me, see the hijab there. Subhanallah. May Allah bless you. Don't give up your Islamic identity. We give examples of you by the will of Allah. I love to speak highly of these countries in West Africa because I've seen with my eyes what I've never witnessed even in Muslim countries. Thank Allah. Alhamdulillah. Don't give up your Islamic identity. We have it. And we are doing it willingly. Under tremendous pressure to give it up. But no one is forcing us to remove it. Thank Allah. There are places where they want it. But they are being forced otherwise. So I tell you, my beloved brothers, my sisters. When this child is before the age of seven. Ideally, taking from the hadith of salah. You are supposed to encourage the child not by way of instruction, but by other means. Primarily, them learning by example. Who led them by that example? You. You were leading by example. Time for salah, you speak of salah. You have the adhan. You have, for example, imama. You have a special place in your house where salah is fulfilled. You have the burqa and various other clothings that are worn or perhaps... Quran, something else that you sit and read, the children will follow automatically. I was saying, sisters with hijab, mashallah, those of you who have children, am I not right when I say that your two-year-old will want to dress like you? Subhanallah. Who told the child? Even you didn't. Those in niqab, for example, and there are some in niqab, they, they always say, our children, they just want to Dress like this. They say, no, I want to be like this. I want to do like that. I'm talking about myself. My little boys, when they were little, they wanted to dress exactly like this. And one day I delivered a lecture in Cape Town. And my son gets up after that 
when everyone was going, he says, hey, hey, now it's my turn. Sit down. And he wanted to talk. Why? It made me cry. That is Allah. It's a gift from Allah. Allah is just trying to tell you, look, we will do our part. But you, you'd better do your part. Now that you see this is happening, just take it and help it grow. Subhanallah. You help it grow. The problem with us, we don't help it grow. What do we do? We extinguish it because we come home and then they see us swearing. When you swear, they will swear. Something interesting, I once attended a course on marriage and I was asked to speak. And you know what? In the interaction, in the interaction I learned something amazing. I want to share it with you. They say when you're looking for a spouse, enter the home and talk to the parents and see what's happening and look at how the parents are getting along because if those parents swear each other, the child will know no better. Obviously, there are exceptions always. But you know, if this child grew up with F's and B's, don't expect F and B to stand for Facebook. No. Those are bad words. Have you not noticed our young boys and girls today? I was in the lobby of this beautiful hotel and I heard some people, I'd like to guess that they were perhaps non-Muslim because if they were Muslim, let me say at least if they saw us, they would have felt, hey, I better not say this. They were using the worst, most vulgar words just to greet each other, just to talk to each other. Just to greet each other. You must be wondering, but how? I'm not going to repeat it here. For what? Why has it become norm? You want to greet someone, you've got to swear with the M word and say, yo, what's up? Come on, how? You cannot do that. How can you call someone with such a dirty name? That's immoral. So what I'm saying is for our children, they watch and they're watching such that Allah has made it that they will look up to you and follow. That's a gift of Allah. So use it, don't abuse it. Make sure you use it. You come home, you look at your wife. You kiss her in the presence of your kids. Can it happen? Nigerian men will say, what? What did you just say? Me? My kids watching? I'm not talking of a long romantic kiss that should happen perhaps behind closed doors. I'm talking of a peck perhaps, a word of love perhaps, a hug perhaps, so that they know how to treat their spouses the day they have spouses. That's what it is. I'd love my kids to know. Sometimes they look and they actually look away and they're like shy. But I wanted you to see it. That's why I did it. You need to know what goes on here. Because if not, you're not going to know. When you have matters and issues that need discussion because there's disagreement, do it behind closed doors. That's a gift you can bless your children with. Behind closed doors, do not let your children into your problems. They are not counselors. They are not people. They actually need the good side, not the bad side. They are young. Let them grow. They don't need to hear everything. Sometimes we want kids to take sides, especially when divorce happens. And we have to talk about this because divorce is huge in terms of ratio. I'd like to think we've crossed the 50% mark. Generally, more than 50% of those who get married divorce. So we have to talk about it. When you divorce, there is a whole new door of ibadah that opens that was not opened before. And that is the rights of the divorced parent and the children and the families. That door wasn't there before. You know, they say nikah opens a door of ibadah. Well, talaq opens another door of ibadah. What is it? To allow a man I did not like or get along with or detest access and custody to his own kids for the sake of Allah. That's an ibadah. Many people block the other parent from access or custody. They say, no way, I'm not going to give access. Why? He's a bad man. I don't want, they're playing with me. No, 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 no. You can't. Allah decided his decision is final. Allah decided and his decision is final. That you know what? That is the father. Come what may. That's the father. 
And you don't ever spoil the upbringing of the child by brainwashing the child against the other parent. And you don't ever think that another parent or the other parent is brainwashing the child just because the child doesn't want to relate to you. I'll give you an example. Recently, there was a couple that divorced. The man phones me and says, can you please tell my wife she needs to give me, she needs to give me access to the kids and custody to the kids and she mustn't tell the kids bad things about me because the kids, when they come to me, they don't even want to be with me. Now, I can't just do that because I don't know both sides of the story. First, I have to call the, 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 the wife and say, what's going on? And she painted a totally different picture. This man swears. This man yells. This man pulls the kids. This man says what? So they don't even want to go to him. When they don't want to go, he's blaming me for brainwashing them. That's what I was saying. No one brainwashed. You did it yourself. You want respect from your own children. You must respect them. How do you expect the ummah to be grown when, subhanallah, you haven't even respected your own kids? You earn the respect. You see from amongst us, when we carry ourselves with respect, that's when we shall be respected. Otherwise, you won't be respected. So my brothers and sisters, what I've done today is only an introduction to the topic. You can't spend 40 minutes talking about how to bring up kids and expect to cover every aspect of it. No, it's an introduction. But I want to tell you something amazing. In your midst, here in this beautiful country of Nigeria, there are scholars, male and female. For the rest of the topic that I've just started now, you must make use of your local scholars. You're the workshops they have, the lessons they have. They are superstars, superheroes. Would you not agree? Those we heard today were superb. Say, mashallah. But some of you didn't even know they existed. Am I right? Come on. Allah is going to ask you about the ni'mah, the favors that he blessed you with. Allah is going to ask you, brother is telling me time up. Is time really up? Thank you, brother. We are democratic, mashallah. You heard what they said. But don't worry. We'll round up, inshallah. So, subhanallah, my brothers, my sisters, make use of the local scholars. That's my cry. Because you have in your midst those who are more qualified than I am. I promise you. But you haven't made an effort to search for them, to look for them, to listen to them, to check. There are those who are so beautiful that I would learn so much from them myself. And I feel embarrassed sometimes to be compared to some who far higher than I am. So do we promise we're going to make use of the local scholars? Do we promise? MashaAllah. Tabarakallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. May he bless this nation. May he bless our families. May he bless those who are going through any issues. May Allah help you through your issues. In fact, let me word it differently. Oh Allah, help every one of us in the issues that we may be facing in our own unique lives. Amen. My brothers and sisters, it's been an honor to be speaking to you. And really, I think I need to go back and take notes from my own talk in order to be able to practice what I preach. May Allah forgive my shortcomings and yours. May Allah open our doors. There's only one problem. Today, I didn't crack any jokes. Did you notice? You noticed? So let's crack one. So what happened is, there is a television station full of young people here, right? Young people. It's called Hal TV. Have you heard about it? H-A-L. It stands for Halal TV. Hal, the first part of it, right? So these young people on Friday, they happened to meet me at their little studio, which is mashallah small. And I went in and I saw the enthusiasm and I saw the young boys and girls there, mashallah. And they were so, so, you know, powered up. And I told them, inshallah, in a few years, you'll have such a big place, you won't even know. Allah will bless it. you. So what happened is, they had a little question that they were asking towards the end of the, the program. We're going to ask quick questions to all of us. And there were four or five of us seated. I was the only non-Nigerian. So the quick question was, 
Name three. Name three Nigerian foods. Now, how can I do that? So, one said X, Y, Z. The other one said A, B, C. Meaning they rattled out names as quick as they could. And then it came to me and I'm the last one. I was like, guy, I'm the only foreigner. You should have started with me. At least I could have had a bigger, you know, a broader selection. But now, what am I going to say? So, all I did is I said, you know what? Uh, as soon as it came to me, I said, Jolof. So that's one. What about the others? So they were saying, what about the other two? I said, the other two are inside the jollof. <laughs> mashallah. You know how it's made? So mashallah. Now let me tell you where I got that from. I got that I was inspired by a little kid. The kid, the teacher says, make a sentence with sugar. So one says, there is sugar in Coke. And the other one says, uh, sugar is very sweet. And the one says, the one says, subhanallah. You can tell that my time is up, right? The battery is going. So the third one says, I drank my tea. So the no, you're supposed to make a sentence with sugar. He says, no, I drank my tea. Yes, no, try again. He says, no, I drank my tea. He says, but where's the sugar? It's in the tea. Allahu Akbar. Okay, so that's what I used with the jollof. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all goodness and ease. I love you all for the sake of Allah. Next year, make sure that we attend and tell the organizers that we will pay double what we have because it's not a payment. It's actually a contribution towards the success of an Islamic event and that is an honor. May Allah reward every one of you and grant you much more than what you have put in. Aqulu qawli hadha. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.